Greetings and welcome to Media Photography, CAS 205, 730. And this is a course that is on, first of all, some camera basics. We're going to go over that today, just the basics of how cameras work and some of the choices that you need to make when you're picking a camera, a few things about how to take care of them. But the bulk of the course is going to be spent on you learning how to use two software programs that are going to be absolutely essential for your career here as a student at Michigan State University at the College of Communication Arts and Sciences. Those two programs in this case are going to be Adobe's Lightroom 4.0 and we're also going to learn about Adobe Photoshop CS6. So it's going to be this summer online session which is going to be particularly intense and interesting for you I hope. So let's get started right away and what we're going to start with is taking a look at some of the cameras here sort of how photography has evolved. I dragged out this old film camera and film is indeed sort of a ancient art nowadays. You know, the silver was on the back of the film and the light came through the lens in the camera and it created images on the negative and then you went into a dark room and choked on all the chemicals and made your prints when you were getting ready to put them into a newspaper or a magazine or some other kind of publication. That was the way photography was for many, many decades. But the advent of digital photography has certainly changed all that. What we have are people taking actually wonderful images with cell phones and other kinds, uh, you know, the iPhone and Androids, those take wonderful pictures. They're limited in what they can do, but you can zoom in and you can zoom out and you can also take a little video with them if you want to. There are also what are called point and shoot cameras, and this is a point and shoot. This is an old Nikon. And basically the reason it's called a point and shoot is because it's designed to be sort of idiot proof. You just point it, you shoot it, and it tries to give you the best picture. Now this is called a consumer level camera, and that means that it's designed for people who are novices. And what they tried to do was because they knew that a novice photographer might not know how to use all the bells and whistles, this camera struggles to try to keep everything in focus. Everything from the foreground to the background to the midground. Um, one of the ways in which you can tell the difference between a snapshot and a photograph is that photographs try to direct your eye to the part of the image that you should look at. A snapshot tries to keep everything in focus and it's sort of designed to give you all the information that you might see in the frame. So a point and shoot camera is sort of the next level up from a, a sort of old fashioned camera. Then at the other end of the spectrum are what are called professional level cameras. And this is a professional level camera. It's a Canon 5D, Mark II 5D. It's an expensive camera. There's a new version out called the Mark III. These are cameras that have a tremendous amount of range to them. I mean, you can do all sorts of wonderful things. They used five of these cameras to shoot the last episode of House, for example, because it shoots such wonderful high def video. So what you have is the consumer level camera on one end and the professional level on the other. And in between, you have what are called the prosumer level cameras. They're sort of halfway one to the other. Nowadays, quite honestly, though, what's happened with photography is that relatively inexpensive cameras can just do amazing things, things that would have cost you literally hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gear to be able to do before. Digital photography has come so far in just a few years that there's wonderful opportunities. So we're going to learn a little bit. You sort of start out with the film camera at one end and then that high level camera at the other. One of the other terms that you need to know, however, is that the difference between a point and shoot and an SLR is that an SLR camera, single lens reflex, like the old film model here, it means that what you see is what you get. You're actually looking at the image that's going to be transferred onto whatever medium you're using, whether it's film or whether it's a card that you put into your camera that captures the information. So a single lens reflex, you have lenses that can be changed on the camera. All you have to do is press a little button, take the lens off, you can put a new lens on. Those are the kinds of things that give you a lot of options so that you can change the lenses to do different things with your camera. Um, a single lens reflex really offers a lot more flexibility than a simple point and shoot. The next less, uh, sort of step up from an SLR in film is the DSLR, which is a digital single lens reflex. And then the highest level is the HDSLR, the high definition single lens reflex. That high definition means that not only does it shoot high pixel format images, but it also shoots high definition video, which is really a remarkable thing. 
Now when we talk about a uh, single lens reflex camera that has the interchangeable lenses, then you have to start worrying about the focal length on the lens. And there is a technical definition for that and you can cal calculate it and calibrate it. But basically what we're talking about is that there are different kinds of lenses that you can buy. The higher the number, and it's measured in millimeters, the closer up, the narrower the field of vision, but the closer up to the image you get. If you're going to try to capture a bird in the sky as it's flying, you're going to probably need a lens that is 300 millimeters or more. What we often see is that there are fixed focal length lenses that would be just 300 millimeters, or you see sometimes that what we have is a zoom lens. This zoom lens, for example, goes from 24 millimeters to 105. So that takes you from, since 35 millimeters is about what the normal eye sees, it takes you from a little bit of a wide angle all the way to a bit of a zoom lens, 105 millimeters, which is kind of nice for portraits. Usually somewhere in the 105 to 135 range is good for portraits. 200 is good for images that are fairly far away, 300 for images that are further away. And when you start getting into those big expensive lenses that you're going to be using if you're shooting race cars at a track from the uh, control booth or the press booth up in the uh, stratosphere, you're going to need a thousand millimeter lens and that's going to be more than my car, more than the cost of my car. So those are the kinds of focal lengths that you need to worry about on lenses. At the other end of the spectrum, when you start going down into the wide angle lenses, I'm shooting this right now with another Canon that has a wide angle zoom on it. And the wide angle lenses go all the way down to what's called a fisheye, and that gives you a 360 degree image. It's a circular image that sort of takes the whole world and turns it into a ball. So that's the range that you will see with the different focal lengths of different lenses. So when you're choosing a lens for your camera, if you have a budget to be able to choose some lenses, it's really kind of nice to try to figure out exactly where you're going to be spending most of your time shooting. Are you going to want an up-close lens, maybe even a macro lens? Macro is a setting on certain cameras where you can have a lens and get right up there and try to see the little antenna on the bees, you know, as they're picking out the pollen. That's how close you can get. At the other end of the spectrum are those big zoom lenses. A lot of times the lenses that you choose have more to do with what your budget allows than what you might like to have. I would certainly love to have a whole bag of lenses. But I've, over the years, been able to put in and invest enough so that I have a nice, that nice wide angle zoom that goes from 16 to 34 millimeters. Then I have this zoom lens that I just showed you that goes up to 105. And then I have a zoom that goes from 200 to 300, so I kind of cover all bases. I'm not sure you'll be able to afford all of those, but those are the choices that professional photographers often face. Part of the issue is not just what you buy, but what can you carry with you? What can you put in a backpack realistically? And afford with a camera, you will have certain options. The more expensive cameras, the SLR, DSLR, HDSLR type cameras, allow you basically to manipulate three variables. A point and shoot camera might give you a few choices, little screens on the back that tell you, okay, it's bright sun, press this button, that kind of thing. But these cameras give you a lot more control. The three things, the three main things other than the equipment itself that determine what your image are gonna look like are the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. Those are the three variables that we're constantly playing with in photography to try to get the look and feel of the situation in the way that we want it. So first you pick the lens that you're going to be using for your photo shoot. Maybe you're using a nice 200 millimeter because you're going to be doing some pretty portraits and you want to kind of make the background fuzzy. So your first choice is what's called the film speed or ISO. It used to be called ASA, but now we call it ISO. Those are various settings that you set in the camera itself and it determines how receptive that chip that's capturing the image is going to be to the light that it gets. It's a way to try to tell the camera how much light is going to be likely to come at it. If you're in a very bright, sunshiny day, beautiful outside, nice open shade, you're probably going to look at a ISO film speed ASA type rating of about 200 maybe, somewhere in that level. At the other end of the spectrum, if it's a low light situation and you're pushing that camera to give you everything that it has to be able to capture that information in almost darkness, you're going to look at 1600 or above. Uh, the difference, of course, is that film had its limitations and you bought a specific film speed and a specific spool of film. You couldn't very often, there was one kind of weird film where you could do it, but most films you had to pick your film speed. And so if you went from a light situation into a dark one, you had to change the role of film in the camera. 
With your nice digital camera nowadays, you just change your ISO speed, and really you can set it to a much higher than what you could with the old-fashioned film days. The second variable, of course, is going to be that shutter speed. How long that shutter that goes chink chink that lets the light in, right? Your lens gathers the light, tries to get it to the chip, but there's that shutter in between. How long that shutter stays open is a fraction of a second. And again, at the low level, that's about a 60th of a, sec uh, of a second. A 60th of a second, it's open fairly a long time, and that means that if you're in a low light situation, it'll try to gather as much information as possible. A thousandth of a second, obviously, is significantly faster, and that means it's gone like that. So use that in a situation where it's nice bright light because you don't want the shutter open very long because you're not going to be able to, you take in too much information, it washes it out. There are two settings also that we frequently see on cameras. Some things call them different by different names, but they're usually a variation of B or T for bulb or test. Sometimes you're doing a wide open photography where you leave that shutter open. Maybe it's in the dead of night and you have one of those little gizmos like I have that sits on top of my camera where you can take a picture now and then, ba-doom, ba-doom, ba-doom. And that way you can leave your lens open and just capture the information as the, uh, with the lens completely open, so that with that shutter completely open so it captures all the information. Sometimes you use that when you're shooting things like fireworks at night. Otherwise you would not get enough of an image necessarily to give you all the detail that you might like. The next variable, of course, is the aperture. On that lens, sometimes when you look inside, you can see that iris open up and shut down, open up and shut down. Again, that determines how much light is gonna get onto the chip that you're using or the card that you're using that's gathering your information, that's taking the photograph. And the aperture on the lens starts usually from a low of about an f1.4, maybe up to an f22. Now an f1.4, oddly enough, is going to mean, even though the number is smaller, that the lens is open more, that the iris is open, letting in as much light as possible. So you have the light coming in through that aperture. It is then going to be cut off or allowed, depending on how long that shutter is open, and then that chip or the compact flash card is going to be capturing that data, and that's basically your film speed, so that's your three variables. Now keep in mind when you're buying a lens, you'll also see Fs, uh, the F series used uh, to describe various lens, uh, lenses. Uh, in a zoom lens, for example, it might be that you can afford to buy an F4 lens, right? Because it can go down to an F4. It means you can use it in relatively low light situations, but it isn't going to be as quote unquote fast a lens, they call it a fast lens, as an F1.4, which is going to let in a lot more light, right? But those lenses tend to be more expensive. So the challenge sometimes is that you have to buy the lens you can afford, maybe not the lens that you'd really like to have. Uh, when you start getting into F1.4 long lenses, especially those that have all the nice little stabilization stuff that makes the camera shape go away, you can start talking, uh, very quickly start talking about thousands of dollars for lenses. So again, your three variables are that film speed, the shutter speed, and the aperture or the f-stop. And the reason that you want to manipulate those in many situations is that we're going to be talking a little bit in this class about some film techniques, but not too much. But one of the things you might want to look for is what we call bokeh. It's that blurry background. One of the nicer things when you can shoot photographs with a good camera is you can kind of smorg out the background on things and show the person exactly what it is you want them to look at because that's the part that's in focus and everything behind it or in front of it is out of focus so it helps the person see what it is you're concentrating on. Cameras where you can manipulate those three variables give you that opportunity to be able to use bokeh, use that blur in creative ways that helps transmit the information and give your pictures uh, that distinction so they don't look like those point and shoot pictures that are, try very hard to have everything in focus. We would think that being in focus completely is a good thing, but not when you're trying to take photographs. You're trying to help the person see what it is that you want them to look at. So using techniques like bokeh and manipulating those three variables can be very important in getting the kinds of images that you want. Now the other part of this is to make sure that you know how to take care of your camera, and I recommend that you take a really good look at your owner's manual for whatever camera you're using. Um, these electronic cameras, for example, they have, you'll see, sensor cleaning sometimes when you turn the camera off. 
and it goes bzz, 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 and it's sensor cleaning. It's got a little electronic shaker in there that's trying to take any little bits of dust or any other kind of uh, detritus that has gotten into uh, the camera body itself. And it's a situation where it tries to shake it off, the mirror tries to shake it off so that it doesn't cause those little dots and imperfections in your images. Uh, very hard to deal with dust in these cameras. Sometimes you have to take it in for professional cleaning because it's pretty dangerous to start playing around sometimes with cleaning that camera inside yourself. Keep your lenses clean as well. That's important. Make sure that you just use a soft cloth on the front of your lenses. I recommend not using any real chemicals on that. You can also use a little you know, uh, like, you know, I wouldn't use the uh, canned air, but I would use one of those little uh, squishy things that have a little brush on it that you can use sometimes to clean your lenses. Another thing I like to do, and now this is controversial because some photographers don't do that, is I put f uh, filters on the front of all of my expensive lenses because I would much rather scratch an $80 filter than a $300 lens, or in some cases, much more than that. So you put a filter on because it doesn't make much difference in the images that you're taking. In fact, it usually enhances them a bit, but at the same time, you're not risking that lens as much. Uh, there are various kinds of filters. There's a haze filter. There's what's called a skylight 1A filter. Some people use what are called neutral density filters. You wouldn't want to use that in a low light situation because it, it does add a bit of color to try to knock off some of the glare of daylight, so you might not want to use that in an evening situation. There's also polarizer filters that you can use. I wouldn't use those as invisible lens caps. I tend to use either a haze filter or a skylight 1A filter as an invisible lens cap. The other big issue with these electronic cameras in particular as well is moisture. I made the mistake of leaving a camera, uh, this camera as a matter of fact, on my seat in the middle of the winter when it was very cold and some moisture got into the camera, condensation, so that when I ran it and I ran the uh, heater on the car, it didn't dry it all off. And I was very lucky, it did dry out in two or three days, but until then my electronics went crazy and I couldn't take any pictures. So be careful with these cameras because it's a major investment and they don't come cheap. So when you get to the point where you can afford a really good one, make sure that you take really good care of it.